Hello and welcome to the London Legal Podcast, presented by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors. Our leading solicitors share their views on latest legal issues and developments, and how the law might affect you, because we care about righting wrongs and providing first-class personal legal services. So please enjoy this, the London Legal Podcast, presented by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors. Welcome to the second in a series of Hodge Jones and Allen Ethical Employment Podcasts. My name is Susie Alkasab and I'm head of the employment team and I'm joined once again by my fellow partners, Homer Wilson and Neil Emery. In our first podcast, we talked about what it means to be an ethical employer and how employers can be more people focused and more principled in how they deal with workplace issues while still achieving their commercial objectives. Today, we take a deeper dive into how this can be applied in practice. With furlough being phased out at the end of the month, many employers will have to decide whether to bring their employees back into work or make them redundant. Many businesses will not have the work to sustain pre-furlough staff levels, and many have also pivoted their business models quite drastically during COVID, so redundancies may be the only option. So we're here today to talk about taking a more ethical approach to making redundancies. Complying with the law, of course, but also leading with empathy and compassion for those affected. So let's start by talking about what taking an ethical approach means in the context of a redundancy exercise. Neil, do you want to comment on that? Thanks, Cesar. Well, the link between workplace restructures and mental well-being has been well documented for quite some time. Facing redundancy puts a strain on professional and personal relationships and can cause feelings of anxiety, depression, and also trigger other mental health conditions. So employee well-being and putting this front and centre of any process is always going to be key for a reasonable employer. So this can mean making counselling and support available throughout the redundancy process, both for those at risk and their representatives, but also for those making these difficult decisions that will impact the lives of their fellow employees. Making redundancies is one of the most emotionally exhausting challenges of leadership, so training, guidance and support are crucial to help managers make fair decisions and to show sensitivity towards the people involved. I completely agree, Neil, and um, taking a more human approach also extends to how the process itself is conducted. So whilst UK redundancy law prescribes steps that have to be followed in order for the process to be fair and lawful, employees do have quite a lot of discretion as to how much effort they really put into things such as communication, consultation and considering alternative roles for employees. This is being tested particularly at the moment with remote working and furlough adding logistical complexities and risking a less personal approach. Yeah, we talked in our first podcast about ACAS and the CBI and the TUC coming out and urging employers to do it with dignity so far as redundancies are concerned and fully and properly consider alternatives. So let's maybe explore that um, a bit more. So planning. I think we'd all agree that businesses don't spend enough time thinking and planning and preparing and there can be a tendency to rush into a process. Redundancy can seem like quite an easy and quick fix but it can be expensive and counterproductive. Yes, there there may be workable alternatives which are less costly and give the business the flexibility it might need as it begins to recover again. And importantly, some options will minimise the negative impact on people. Many of the alternatives may appeal to your employees, whether their role might be at risk or not. So having an honest discussion with staff and getting their input up front on the need for redundancies and what the alternatives might be could not only avoid redundancies, but better stabilise your business too. Options could include agreeing temporary or permanent changes to working time and pay, removing overtime, reallocating resources across the business, and making better use of flexible working. Absolutely. And planning is also important in terms of ensuring that decision making is fair and transparent, which are both vital elements to a fair redundancy. There will always be rumours and assumptions in this sort of situation with the potential to cause unrest and unnecessary additional stress. And in fact, many of the inquiries we receive from employees result from employers failing to explain the rationale for redundancies and their plan process. And that is why every good redundancy plan sets out what, how, and when you'll share updates, consult, and provide feedback. So if it's a large or a complex redundancy situation, wherever possible, even where numbers impacted don't trigger the legal collective consultation obligations, 
businesses should always go one step further and work with staff representatives to try and develop and consult on the plans. Yeah. Also, it's easy to miss out staff who are on sick leave or maternity leave. And businesses need to ensure that they are making special arrangements to ensure that those individuals are part of the process right from the outset. So out of sight must never be out of mind when it comes to redundancy. This is a particular issue we've seen during the pandemic for women on maternity leave being excluded from restructure plans, meaningful consultations and considerations for alternative roles and even being singled out for redundancy. And planning, you know, it's not just about the numbers and the process. There's a lot more to it than that. And, and one of those aspects that, that needs particular attention, I think, is selection. So maybe let's move on to that part of the process now. Where the number of roles in particular areas of the business is being reduced, fair selection is key. And it's probably one of the most heavily disputed and litigated aspects of redundancy. Often from the employee's perspective, and this is what we hear a lot, being selected, they can't objectively explain it. And there's been no real justification from the employer. That's especially true, I think, when the employees are high performer and yet they've ended up with one of the lowest scores on selection. And certainly from our perspective, there shouldn't be any place for lip service in this part of the process. And it's really important to get selection right. Important for the organisation, of course, because you know the organisation needs to retain the staff with the right skills and experience for the roles going forward. But also important for employees to understand and buy into the criteria and the process so that they'll feel that they've been fairly assessed. And even if they then don't like the outcome, you know, they're more likely to accept it. Homer, do you have any particular advice for businesses on selection? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's one of the most uh, sort of important areas and one of the areas that employers often get wrong and then find themselves at the receiving end of a claim. And there are three main phases of selection. So one, deciding on a redundancy pool. Two, identifying the selection criteria. And three, applying the selection criteria fairly and openly. I think there are three main things to think about. Firstly, take the time to consider the different measures of performance and ability of those employees who are at risk and ensure that the criteria are relevant, fair and objective where possible. This is not an off-the-shelf exercise and has to start with the retained role you're selecting for and a clear job description for that role. It's not an assessment of performance, but rather an assessment of someone's ability against the role required. And I often have to challenge clients on how this can be done without a clear and detailed job description. Secondly, use objective measures and written records wherever possible. So look at data like sales figures, revenue generated, appraisals. But you do also need to be mindful of individual issues when considering seemingly objective evidence. So in some cases, sales numbers might have been affected by absences. Appraisals might have been carried out irregularly, missed during plan absences or done differently by different managers. In any event, subjective opinions based on personal allegiances should absolutely be avoided. Discuss criteria and scoring with staff before you finalise your approach. This will allow you to identify and address any issues with your preferred method and as such ensure that you avoid any disputes or further down the line. It also shows that you're being open and honest, which in turn will instill trust in the process. Also, avoid presenting selection to staff as a fair company, as it looks like you're simply picking off unwanted individuals, even if that's not the case. The final thing which we haven't talked about is finding alternative roles. Legally, employers must make a reasonable effort to find potentially redundant staff alternative employment within the company or the group. Um, and less conscientious employers will direct employees to a list of vacancies to quickly and easily discharge that obligation. Um, and while that may be enough within the letter of the law, it's not really within the spirit of it. And it leaves a lot to be desired when it comes to putting people first. So what does doing the right thing look like in practice when it comes to alternative roles? Neil, any thoughts on that? Yeah, um, there are quite a few steps that a reasonable and an ethical employer will take. With all of this, we're, we're really looking at fairness because that is the best way to both protect an employer, but also to make sure that employees are treated as well as can possibly be treated under obviously very difficult circumstances. 
So one of the first things employers need to do is to consider speaking to the employee about their skills and their experience and get their up-to-date CV, get to know what their particular skills are, what they enjoy and where their interests lie, so that they can focus on the search properly. Ideally, HR should also liaise with their counterparts in other areas of the business, if there are any, about available roles and keep in touch in case a vacancy comes up. Don't deal with it at the outset and then assume that you've, you've covered off that area. Give employees as much information as possible on alternative roles to help them make an informed decision. Also, try and allow time for interviews and assessments, especially if there are several people going through the redundancy process and applying for the same roles. Also, continue the search to the employee's last date of employment. An employer's duty doesn't end at the same time as the consultation period ends, so do keep that alive even up to the last day of employment. Consider even delaying termination to allow time for an employee's application for alternative employment to be determined. There are also a number of don'ts here as well as do's. So don't assume that the employee won't be interested in a role just because of a reduced salary or status. Speak to them about it. Give them a chance to apply anyway. Don't rule out consultancy or part-time work without speaking to them. Also, don't forget about employees who aren't in the business at the time you're going through the process. So that includes those people on maternity leave or shared parental leave or adoptive leave. They have an automatic right to be offered first refusal on any suitable position if their role is at risk. Don't be in a rush and force a quick decision about alternative roles. Build in enough time for employees to consider their options properly. And don't automatically open applications for the entire workforce without considering at-risk employees first. Don't forget to document your efforts in supporting an employee's search for alternative employment. It's always helpful to have notes in case an employee questions your commitment or a tribunal becomes necessary. So certainly a lot more to it than simply directing employees to a list of vacancies. This is all great advice and practical ways in which businesses can take a more ethical approach. So just to recap, what we've talked about today is exploring every avenue to avoid job cuts planning to do what you can to ensure that those affected are supported and listened to, be objective, transparent and as database as you can in your selection, and be proactive in looking for alternative employment within the business as a kind of final lifeline right up until they leave. Thank you, Homer and Neil. Not an easy subject, but one where employers can make changes in their approach and do the right thing. Thanks everyone for listening. And if you have any comments or questions for us, please get in touch. You can also follow us on social media and please also check out our blog series on ethical redundancies where you'll find much of what we've talked about today and more. Make sure you also follow us on YouTube or SoundCloud so you can join us next time when we'll be talking about ethical and progressive workplace policies. Thanks very much. Thank you for listening to the London Legal Podcast presented to you by Hodge, Jones and Allen Solicitors. To listen to more podcasts, follow us on SoundCloud or visit our website www.hja.net for interesting opinions and the latest legal information. Or if you need our help, call 0808 2780 216.